Afternoon Year 10, welcome back to your next lesson. Hello Year 10 and welcome back to your second edition of Living Room Lessons. I hope you enjoyed the shambles that was the first one. Yes, you have got to put up with these for the majority, not the majority, for the foreseeable future, for every lesson moving forward, okay? Um, my well-being update for today is download the app House Party. It is great fun. Get all your friends to download it. You can have video chats, you can stay in touch, you can play games, quizzes with each other. It's a really good laugh, all right? So get on that. Keep yourself socialising. You don't have to be with people to be sociable, remember? Okay, so moving on to today's lesson. Our next lesson is, um, as you can see on the board, um, don't need anything extra today. Actually, just your exercise book, a pen, a ruler, a pencil if you're a bit scruffy. And again, if you can have your phone because there's gonna be some QR codes to keep you updated, all right? So let's start off as we always will with our jog your memory for this lesson. So three questions, name three factors that affect climate, give three groups of people who benefit from globalization, and what is a self-help scheme? If you pause your phone in a minute when the QR code comes up, scan it on your phone, it'll take you to a Google Docs and I will be able to see how many of you have tuned in this time. Okay, hopefully you've all had a go at our job your memory. The first question is a key one I want to think about because this is what we did in our last video, having a look at the different factors that affect our climate. So hopefully you got the four main ones we looked at. Latitude, altitude, distance from the sea and prevailing winds. Now these four physical factors, if you remember rightly, are some of the main factors that affect what kind of climate different places are going to get. Now, what we're going to come on to today is something a little bit different, but also very closely related. And again, I will say it's quite complicated. So you might find that you have to pause, rewind, rewatch me over and over and over again until you fully, fully understand this. Because what we're having a look at today is high and low pressure, which I'm sure are terms you've heard thrown around loads and loads of times on weather shows. Um, and you probably not really had an idea what they were talking about. You would have also done it in year eight, but I'm sure you also probably didn't have a clue what they were in year eight. So what we're hopefully gonna do today is unpick the difference between high and low pressure, the different weather that we get from it, and we are gonna have a look at how you can uh, identify these different weather types on synoptic charts. So the general principle of how air pressure works. So air pressure is the weight of air that is pressing down from above, okay? There is always, as we know, or we wouldn't be breathing, all this air constantly around us. And it is the weight at which the air is pressing down that leads to different weather conditions. So we will start with high pressure, okay? So high pressure is when our air is sinking. It's called high pressure because there's a high amount of air pressure pushing down because it is sinking. And as it's sinking, that air is moving from a very, very cold place high up in the atmosphere, which as we know from last lesson, when we were having a look at how altitude affects climate, it's much colder the higher in the atmosphere you are. So as that air is sinking, it is going from a very cold place high up to quite a warm place down on the surface of the earth. And as it's moving from a cold place to a hot place, the process of evaporation will occur. So as we go from wet, wet air high up, moving downwards, forcing down because of the high pressure, it's going to evaporate any moisture that is in that air. So when we have periods of high pressure, it means that we've got not a lot of moisture in the air. You generally are gonna have quite calm conditions, clear skies, doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be hot because we can get high pressure during winter. But generally what it means is there's not gonna be many clouds. It means that we're gonna have quite clear skies. You're gonna see the sun like we've been having the last couple of days. We also uh, refer to this, sorry, as an anticyclone. So areas of high pressure are known as an anticyclone. And then we have the opposite, which is our periods of low pressure. And when we have periods of low pressure, because that pressure is low, it means that the air is rising. There's no air forcing down on us. There's a low amount of air pressing down on you and on the Earth's surface. So that air is generally rising. And as it's rising, it does the complete opposite to a period of high pressure. 
as we go from low pressure, that air is going from quite a warm place and rising upwards into quite a cold place. And as it goes from a warm to a cold place, this then leads to condensation. So the particles start to stick together. And when they start to stick together, this is what leads to clouds. That water vapour all starts to condense and stick together, creating clouds. So when we have a period of low pressure, this is when we've got quite cloudy, rainy, windy conditions. There's a lot going on in the atmosphere because all of that air has gone from a hot place to a cold place and the moisture has been forced to condense together, creating clouds. We also know this as a depression. So what, oh, a good way to remember this, sorry, um, is if it's a period of high pressure, it's high because the air is heavy. It's moving down because it's so heavy, it can't be held up anymore. So it's forcing its way down. In a period of low pressure, the air is light. There's not, for, it's not forcing down on us. In fact, it's rising upwards. So high pressure equals heavy, low pressure equals light. So what I would like you to do first of all in a moment is you are going to pause the video and I would like you to make a copy of this diagram, okay? You don't have to draw a sunshine with sunglasses on, but please by all means do if you want to. But this diagram shows us nicely the difference in high pressure and low pressure. It shows what's happening to the air, it shows the processes and it gives us the names of anticyclone and depression. So pause your videos and Make a copy of this diagram for me, please. Okay, hopefully you've made uh, nice diagrams in your books, nice copies in your books with all of the key facts on there. So what I've got on the board are two different examples of weather maps. Now, weather maps or synoptic charts are one of the key ways to be able to read what type of air pressure we've got and what kind of weather conditions we will be having because of that air pressure. Now this I think is a really cool little skill because how many times do you sit and watch the weather at home and you see all these lines and colours all coming across and everyone's like, oh, what does that mean? Now, hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to tell us what that means. But before we dive into unpicking the difference in a high and low pressure, I would like you just to quickly get this key term down. Um, so the, these lines on your weather maps are what we know as isobars. So they follow a very similar principle to contour lines on a map, for example, in that they show lines of equal pressure. So if you think of it in terms of each line is a different amount of pressure. And the closer our lines are together, that shows that the pressure is changing quicker, the same as a contour line. It's rising rapidly, which means that we're going to be able to see um, one of our types of weather system. So if you could very quickly in your books make this key term, isobar, a line of equal pressure. I'm not going to put this up on the board, so I'll say it again. Isobar, a line of equal pressure. So what we're going to do in a moment is a little game of spot the difference. I'm going to put those two maps back up at the moment but underneath is going to be a range of different ways that we can tell the difference between high pressure on a weather map and low pressure. So before we do that, I very quickly want you to make a copy of this table. So just a little T-bar with high pressure on one side and low pressure on the other. So pause your screens, take 30 seconds to make a copy of this table. Okay, hopefully you've made a copy of that table now. So the next thing I would like you to do on the board, um, keep calling the TV the board, that feels strange. On my board, um, we have got two weather maps. So on the left is our high pressure weather map and on our right is our low pressure weather map. And then at the bottom, I've got a range of different statements that describe either a high pressure map or a low pressure map. And what I would like you to do is, I would like you in a moment to pause your screens again and I would like you to, in your table, sort these statements into whether that is high pressure or low pressure. So you're going to have to look closely at these maps and you're going to have to determine whether they are um, things you would expect to see on a high pressure synoptic chart or a low pressure synoptic chart. Okay, so pause your screens now and have a go at this and we'll go through the answers in a moment. Okay. Hopefully you have had a look at that. Um, what we're going to do is we'll talk through the answers together now. So 
together, or we're not together, but we'll talk through them. I'll talk through them and you're there listening to me, so we're basically together. Um, so on our high pressure map, we can see that our ISO bars are more spread apart, okay? So that doesn't mean that we've got rapid rising air because we know that in a period of high pressure, our air is sinking. Okay. We can also see that our winds are moving in a clockwise direction. We can see that from our red arrows. Uh, we can see that the units, so the units of measurement of pressure, are all above a thousand. It's higher, so there's going to be higher numbers. Um, and then if we move on to our low pressure map, it's kind of the opposite. We can see that our lines are much closer together because we've got this rapidly rising air. And as it rapidly rises, that is when we have our change in weather. So I know they're not completely close together compared to this one, but we can see, especially in this area here, that our lines are much closer together. We can also see that the winds are moving in an anti-clockwise direction this time. In our period, or our main area of low pressure, we can see that the units are below a thousand, so there is a lower amount of pressure. Um, and lastly, we can see, and I was hoping some of you would pick this one up, although I didn't tell you about it, we have got a weather front evident. Now we will come back to weather fronts in a few lessons time, but these are indicators that there are certain types of weather in this area at this given moment. So we can see here our weather front. So your table should look, sorry, something like this. High pressure, isobars spread apart, clockwise winds and units above a thousand. In low pressure, the isobars are closer together, there's anti-clockwise winds, the units are below a thousand, and we've got weather fronts evident. Okay, it is key that we haven't got weather fronts evident in a high pressure, because I said that's when we have fairly settled weather, there's not going to be any fronts coming in. But as I said, we will come back to that later. Sorry, I got cut off there because my phone ran out of uh, storage, so I've just had to delete lots of photos from 2015. As I was saying, you're going to make a copy of this Venn diagram in your book. Please either draw it quite big so you can fit quite a lot of writing in, or draw it quite small and then space underneath so you can just put numbers in the Venn diagram. It will become clear in a minute. So just very quickly now, I will pause, um, well you will pause, and I want you to make a quick copy of this. So we've got winter anticyclone in one circle, summer anticyclone in the other, and then that leaves a gap in the middle for factors which uh, characteristics we might find in both. Okay, so you should have made a copy of the Venn diagram. This will make it a bit clearer what I want you to do. So here we have got 13 statements about anticyclones, some from summer, some from winter, some from both. What I would like to do, first of all, this is the biggest treat you're gonna get from me. Scan this QR code and you will be taken to the best YouTube video ever. If you're not enjoying it, imagine me singing along because I know every single word. Then what I would like you to do is sort these statements into your Venn diagram. So are they describing a winter anticyclone, a summer anticyclone, or both? So as I said, you either are writing them directly into your big Venn diagram, or you are list writing these out underneath, numbering them, and then you can just put your numbers into the Venn diagram, your choice. So pause your phones now, pause your videos now, and have a go at this. Okay, five hours later, I'm sure you've all listened to that video on repeat for the last five hours because it is that good. Let's go through your answers, okay? So no rain, we would put in both. There is no rain during anticyclones because there's no clouds, it's high pressure. Cool nights, so cool nights we're gonna put in summer because it is cooler during the summer in the nights. Very little cloud, we will put in both because you get very little cloud in both. Settled weather for days, we will also put in both. Early morning frost goes into winter because it's going to be very, very cold during the winter. Yes, there are no clouds, but because there are no clouds, it means the clouds actually keep in some of the heat. So it means that it's gonna be really, really cold. So on those cold days and nights, those beautiful crisp winter days, there's likely to be frost in the mornings. Very cold nights is also in winter. Cold days is in winter. Early morning dew and mist, that's gonna go in your summer. So in your summer, any moisture that there is in the atmosphere is going to evaporate into dew and mist, all right? Light winds, you'd put in both, but we're talking very light. The puddles freezing over, obviously not gonna have ice in the summer, so that's in your winter. Hot days goes into summer, as does heat wave, and water pipes may burst and homes may be flooded, could technically go into both, because you could have them bursting from them freezing, or you could have them bursting because the metal expands during the heat of the summer. So that could go into both. Just check your answers and then maybe repeat this if you didn't quite get them the first time. 
So now I'd like us to have a go at an exam question on comparing our two different anticyclones. So it's a six mark question, compare the hazards that will be created by an anticyclone in summer versus winter. Now for the first time I'm going to come over to my uh, whiteboard and see how this goes because we're going to do a little structure of it together. So if it is a six mark question, we are going to be making sure that we are peeing the hell out of it. So we are going to be making a point, elaborating and explaining. So our point could be during winter, anticyclones lead to intense frost. Okay, so we've got intense frost during the winter. Now we need to give in an explanation. So this is due to high pressure leading to a lack of clouds. How is this pen dying already? Now we need to do another explanation of it, so we need to elaborate that point further. So this is due to high pressure leading to a lack of clouds, resulting in very cold temperatures, allowing puddles, yes I have just said puddles in an exam answer, to freeze. So I've made a point, I've explained it, and I've elaborated it. So I've effectively given you the first half of your six marker. I would like you now to have a go at doing the second half. So explaining what it is like in summer. So same process, make a point, explain it, elaborate it to say what weather hazards you would get in a summer anticyclone. So freeze the board, there's your question, have a go for me. Good work with that guys. The last thing we are going to have a look at then is the extra added symbols that you could find on a synoptic chart. So you've already got notes in your books about um, what the isobars mean on a synoptic chart. Now what we might tend to find are symbols which show what the particular weather is like in a particular area as generated by a normally a weather station in a place. Now this is a very complicated key. You will never really have to learn this. You will probably have a key if there is a question asking you to describe a weather station, but we will talk through it together. So I'm, I'm get down on my knees again. So this is our weather station, okay? Now, first thing we have is our wind speed. So the increase here, as we can see, if the wind speed increases, the tail of it will also increase. Um, we also will always find that it is facing the direction the wind is blowing. So this wind is blowing from the southwest, as we can see. Um, we then come on to our circle. Now this links into what we were looking at in our last lesson where I mentioned the word octa. So octa is a measurement for cloud cover. And it basically means how much of the sky is covered in cloud. So the darker the colour it shows, the darker the black, sorry, shows that there is a high amount of cloud. If there's only a small amount, two octas maybe, we would say that it's, there's a few clouds but not a huge amount. Um, we'll also always have a number which shows the temperature um, we will also have a little symbol which shows what the present weather is like. So is there any precipitation? And then you will have one of these symbols here. So using this weather station here, we can see that they've got um, six octaves of clouds, so quite a lot of cloud cover. They've got a 20, more than 20 knots, sorry, um, 20, 25 knot wind blowing from the southwest. It's a temperature of 12. Uh, and there is rain. So this would be a classic low pressure system. We can see lots of rain, lots of cloud, quite windy. So what I would like you to do is I would like you in your books to make copies of these two weather stations here and then underneath I want you to describe what the weather is like in these places. So please use a pencil, make it neat for me. Um, pause your video, copy these two weather stations and then use the key to describe what the weather is like in these places. Okay, so let's check through your answers again. So on this first weather station, we've got uh, two octaves of cloud, so it's not that cloudy. Um, We've got southeasterly winds, quite strong ones, 25 knots there. Um, we've then got uh, 
a shower, so there are some showers, some rain, and then it's about 15 degrees. So it's a little bit windy and wet, but not hugely. This one, complete sky cover, okay? So there is no clouds, the clouds are, the sky is completely obscured. We've got snow, it's six degrees, so it's a lot colder, and then we've got winds coming in from the northeast, but they're not that strong, okay? So we've got some northeasterly winds. Hopefully you got those correct. If not, correct them. So we come to the end of our second lesson. Well done, how's it going? You enjoying this? You enjoying seeing my face still, year tens? So just to recap, you should have a diagram of high and low pressure, isobar key term written out, the characteristics of high and low pressure on a synoptic chart, that's your T-bar table, uh, an anticyclone Venn diagram, your six mark answer, and your two described weather stations. Hopefully you've got all of that. If not, flick back through. Thank you for tuning in for your second video, guys. Um, I'm sure it's nice to see my face. Um, please keep in touch. Email me if you have any questions and uh, I'll see you again on your next video. Well done. You're brilliant. I'll say that every time because you are.